I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, I, I leaned over to Dr. Aiken just a second ago and, and told him I've, I've preached in a lot of places over the course of the last few years in a lot of places in the country and I want you to know how rare it is to sense the spirit of the living God moving in a group of people and I believe that he moved today powerfully and so I just want you to know uh, what a great privilege it is to be here today. Um, Dr. Aiken, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look today at, uh, we're going to answer the question, or rather I'm going to look at and tell you why I made the decision to preach expositionally as a young church planner. Last December, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary of my church, the Austin Stone Community Church. Um, and, it, and it was a great time in my life because I was able to reflect back on all that God had done and all that he was doing. And I, I began, as the anniversary drew near, I began to think about a lot of the decisions that God had led me to over the years to bring us kind of to the place where we are. And I, I was 28 years old when I started the church, moved to Austin, Texas. It was uh, one of the, there still is, one of the most liberal and unchurched cities in the state and, and even in the nation. I was young. I was idealistic. I thought I knew so much about life and, and ministry and and as a lot of you guys are going to realize, when you start churches or move into pastorates or going to the mission field, you're going to realize you don't know near as much as you think you think you know the longer you go down the road. But as I realized, looking back at the last 10 years, I've come to the conclusion that every single good thing that has happened in the church, every single good thing that has happened through the church, every single solitary good thing that's happened in me or through me has been because of the grace of God in my life. And I will tell you this, I'm going to tell you today about one of the greatest gifts that God has given me, the one of the greatest gifts of his grace that he has given me, and that is how he revealed to me in the scripture how I was to preach as a young pastor. When I started the Austin Stone, the seeker-sensitive or the seeker-friendly movement was, was in full swing in the day. Churches like Willow Creek and Saddleback and North Point, which are great churches, those were the models of church. And the models of preaching that everybody was looking at at the time. And, and they were the, uh, the most popular preachers of the day were preaching, kind of preaching that I'd call topical preaching. And, and the way that I would define topical preaching is this, is it, it, and, and this may not be the, the most accurate definition of it, but I define it this way. It's when the preacher has something that he wants to say. When the preacher has a point that he wants to make sits around, thinks about it. He's got a topic that he wants to discuss, and so what he does is the, the topic, the, the, the thing that he wants to say is the place where he begins, and then what he does is he goes to the Scripture to support, and kind of in a piecemeal way, he takes uh, bits and pieces from all over the place in the Bible to support the point that he wants to make, to, to, to support the thing that he's trying to say. And this is in opposition to expositional preaching, which I would define it like this. It's when... The preacher goes not first to the point that he's trying to make, but when the preacher goes to the word of God first. He goes to the word of God first, and instead of the starting place being what he wants to say, the starting place is what God has already said. And then he uses his illustrations and his stories and life experience to support what it is that the word of God has already said. And so as a, as a young church planner, I had a decision to make. It's going to be a decision that a lot of you in the room are going to have to make. That's what kind of preacher am I going to be? How am I going to preach the word of God? And am I going to preach topically like so many of the successful preachers of the day were doing? Or was I going to preach expositionally? I, uh, I had a lot of people whispering in my ear and telling me that it would never work in a city like Austin, Texas. Dr. Aiken mentioned this. I had a ton of people. That I, was, I was processing this thing about, they told me, it will not work in a city like Austin. You can't go into a liberal city, a city where there is a, the, the, the intellectual center of, of, the, of the state of Texas and just go verse by verse. You have to be more creative than that. You have to get people's attention. They told me it would never work, and so I did something crazy. I just decided I would actually look at the Word of God and see what the Bible had to say about the subject. And when I did, I came across this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Let's read this together. 
Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth. He says, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He says this, verse 5, he says, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now let's look at that first verse together, and, and let's just kind of take this uh, section of verses apart, and let's look at what the Scripture is saying to us about how we are to preach the testimony of God. Look at verse 1. Paul said, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with a superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. What Paul is saying to us is this, is that when I came to the church proclaiming the testimony of God, there was a way which he did not do it. He says, the way that I did not come to you to preach. There's a way that I did not come to you and proclaim to you the testimony of God. And that was with a superiority of speech. With the superiority of wisdom. And so in other words, when Paul preached the testimony of God, he wasn't trying to persuade people to follow Jesus with his amazing rhetorical ability or, or superior human wisdom or, or cleverness or, or being entertaining. And as a young preacher that was trying to discern how I was to preach, those words right there were critical for me. They were critical for me to hear. Because church, as I said earlier, that's what everybody was doing. All the men that I looked to and was like, oh man, if one day I could be like those guys, that's the way they were preaching. There was a conference at the time, I think it was still going on, and the whole point of the conference was to teach you how to be more creative in your preaching and in your church so that you could wow lost people with your creativity. As a young pastor beginning this church plan, I felt an amazing amount of pressure. Amazing amount of pressure as the Sunday, the first Sunday of our church drew near to, to stand in the pulpit and to say something that would dazzle my congregation. I felt an amazing amount of pressure to, to stand in the pulpit and to say something intellectually stimulating or to present the truth in, in a way that nobody had ever heard before. Or you know, you know what I'm saying? So the people would flood the aisles and make decisions for Jesus. I felt that pressure to come up with those words. Paul just right out of the blocks in that section of scripture said, that's not how I preached. That's not the burden that I felt in the pulpit. He said, I don't preach with a superiority of speech. I don't come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with persuasive human wisdom. And so men and women, that begs the question then, if Paul's not coming to proclaim the testimony of God with a superiority of speech or this advanced human wisdom to wow his congregation, how then did he preach? That it begs the question, look at verse 2. Verse 2 tells us, in verse 3 tells us how it is that he preached. In verse 2 it says this, he says, For I determined, in other words, I made the decision, I set my face to this, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I said, when I did come to you and proclaim the testimony of God, Paul says, this is what I preached. I preached to you Jesus. I preached to you Christ. And him crucified. When I came to you, I didn't come with this feeling that I had to have a superior speech. I came to you and presented to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and guys, this is what I want you to hear. This is what I believe with all my heart that Paul is, is teaching right here is this. Is that when you preach, when you stand in the pulpit and, and you begin to preach, somebody is going to be, I want you to hear this, somebody is going to be the star of your sermon. Every time you preach, every time you stand in front of your church or, or a, a group of people that don't know the, the Savior in the hills and the mountains of Afghanistan, every time you preach, someone is going to be the star of your sermon. Somebody is going to be highlighted. Someone is going to be exalted every single time you preach. And the question becomes, will the star of your sermon be Jesus? Or will the star of your sermon be you? And I am convinced 
I am convinced, because I see it all the time, that you can preach in such a way where people walk out of your sermon talking about how great you are and not walking out of the sermon talking about how great Jesus is. Right? Paul said, I don't preach to exalt me. Paul said, I preach to exalt Jesus. And so I came across that verse as a young pastor was about to get into the pulpit. For the very first time, I made the decision right then and there that I was going to preach in such a way that I was going to endeavor and I was going to pray towards this end, that I was going to preach in such a way that at the end of the time, Jesus would be the one getting the glory. As a matter of fact, there's a prayer that I pray every single solitary time I sit down to prepare a sermon. I pray the same prayer. There's a prayer that I pray every time before I walk into the pulpit. I sat right here in the front row and I prayed this prayer. And it's really simply this. And I prayed it every time I've ever preached. I pray, Jesus, would your name be exalted over my name right now? I just simply pray that. Or as I stand in the pulpit, as I'm preparing the sermon, would your name be lifted above my name? Would your, and I pray this, would your name be lifted above the name of my church? I pray, would your name be lifted above any human? Would, at the end of the day, Lord, would people be talking about you and how great you are? That's what Paul says. I came, and when I preached, I preached to you Jesus so that he would be exalted. Paul continues. He tells us how he preaches. This next verse is critical. Look at verse 2 again. He says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. I believe that's critical. Paul talks about the condition of his heart when he comes and when he preaches. I think this is in contrast to the person that comes with lofty speech and persuasive words of wisdom. You have to question a person's heart if that is their intention. Paul said that's not how it came. There, there's a humility in the heart of Paul when he comes to preach. He says he comes with fear and trembling, much trembling. Those are strong words. It's all, and, and, and hear this right here. It's almost as if he realizes that there is something bigger, that there's something more powerful that can happen. There's something bigger than his words when he preaches. There's something more powerful that can occur in the preaching event than, than if he comes and simply just tries to present this picture of, of cleverness of speech. And that's exactly what he says in the next verse. Look at verse four. He talks about something more powerful than his words and his wisdom that can be presented during the preaching event. In verse four, he says, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, he says, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Paul says there's a way that you can preach. Now I want you to hear this. <laughs> there's a way that you can preach that when you preach, there will not be a demonstration of the Spirit and His power. There's a way, Paul says, that, that you can stand up in the pulpit and there will not be a demonstration of the Spirit. There will not be a movement of the Spirit. There's a way that you can preach. There will not be the power of God being demonstrated to your people. It might be funny. Your sermon might be humorous. It might be clever. You, you might present things in a way they've never thought about before. It might be attention getting, but there is a way that you can preach that the Spirit of God and His power will not be demonstrated. And then Paul says that there is a way that you can preach that will bring forth His Spirit and His power. That you can preach and there will be a demonstration of the Spirit of God and His power. Now let me just ask you a question. Let me just, this, is, this is Sunday School 101 right here. What words does the scripture say are inspired by the Spirit of God and therefore possess the power of God? What words are those? Your words or the Word of God? The scripture very clearly says there are, there's one little group of words that possess the power of God and it is His Word. The power in your preaching will not come from your words. The power in your preaching will not come from your stories. The power in your preaching will not come from your amazing illustrations and the power and a demonstration of the Spirit of God will not come from your awesome application. The, the, the power 
in your preaching will come from one place and that is the word of God alone. It's the only way. The only way that you can guarantee that your, pre- that your preaching will possess the power of God is when you are preaching the word of God. That's it. And then, and then Paul in verse five tells us what's at stake when we preach. Um, as a young church planner, when I read uh, verse four and five, I realized that there would be profound and horrible implications if the star of my preaching was not Jesus and the content of my preaching was not the word of God. All right, I wanna say that again. I realize there are profound and horrible and eternal implications if the star of my preaching is not Jesus and the content of my preaching is not his word. Look at verse four again. He says, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now here's why. In verse five, he says, so that your faith would rest not on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. I wanna read that one more time. He says, I preach this way, not in persuasive words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit of God and his power so that your faith would rest not on the wisdom of man, but your faith would rest on something altogether better, and that is the power of the living God. (laughs) What the verse is saying there is that the faith of your congregation This is profound. The implications are unbelievable. The faith of your congregation are going to rest on one of two foundations. The faith of your congregation is going to rest on a foundation of your wisdom, your intellect, your persuasive words, or your humor. Or the uh, the faith of your church, your congregation, your your sheep, your flock are going to rest on on a foundation of the power of of the living God. It's gonna rest on one of those two foundations and what the Bible seems to be indicating here is there's a direct connection which foundation your people's faith are gonna rest on and it's connected to your preaching. And that's nuts. And so I read this scripture and, and I was convinced on how I was going to preach. And so on the very first Sunday of our church, the opening of our church, I walked into the pulpit. The first things out of my mouth are, open up your Bibles to the book of John. John chapter one, verse one. And I read the text and I preached the text. Dr. Aiken, you were a little off. It didn't take me two years, it took me four and a half to preach through the gospel of John in a city where everybody said it couldn't work. I got done with John and I preached the book of 1 Corinthians. Got done after two years with 1 Corinthians and preached two years through Genesis. Got done through Genesis and now we're in the Gospel of Mark. And I do, I pray every once in a while we, we have series that we preach but they're expositional. And I want you to know that God has blessed our church in ways that I could never have imagined were possible. It's not because I'm a great preacher. It's because the content that I preach is great. Listen, I, uh, I debated as to whether I was gonna say this, but I, I think I'm gonna say it. This week, the President of the United States stood in his pulpit during the inauguration, and he publicly endorsed a lifestyle of sin that is 100% contrary to the teaching of the book that I hold in my hands. The church of Jesus Christ is going to come under a critique and a fire in the public arena over the next 20 or 30 years that I think has been unimaginable in our lifetime. I, I am absolutely convinced that's gonna happen. Your people's faith cannot be built on a foundation of your wisdom. Your people's faith must be built 
on a foundation of the power of the living God. So, when it comes time for you to make that decision, whether it's in the pulpit, whether it's in a counseling room, whether it's in a youth ministry somewhere, or whether it's somewhere around the world where you are overseas for the nations, you gotta answer the question, do I preach the wisdom of men? Or do I preach the word of God? I pray today that you would remember in that moment of questioning the words of Paul in 2 Timothy that said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and by his kingdom. Preach the word. Let's pray. Father, the number of people that are represented in this room, the number of people that are gonna be impacted by the men and the women in this room is impossible to count. And Father, when these men and these women go out into the ministry, what comes out of their mouth is gonna matter. Your word says it will. And so, Father, I pray right now through your spirit and through your power that you would place a call in their lives to be faithful teachers, preachers of the word of God, whether it is one-on-one to a person in some faraway land or whether it is standing in a pulpit in the Bible Belt. I pray they would preach the word. To this end, we ask this, that the glory of your name would be the passion of the church. I ask that for the glory of your name. And so it is in your name that we pray. Amen.